Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Dr. Howlett has given me the responsibility of supporting the proposition. My disclosures are listed here uh, related to my involvement in the clinical trial in this area. Here's the proposition that continuous positive airway pressure to treat obstructive sleep apnea provides cardiovascular benefit. Now, there's overwhelming evidence, and most of you agree that this should be done, so the debate could conclude just by summarizing the evidence here in favor of treatment. The prevalence, it's an important problem. The pathophysiology, terrible for the cardiovascular system. The consequences are considerable. The prognostic implications are dreadful. And there is no current device or drug therapy for heart failure that suppresses these risks. And there are positive results from a number, an abundance of observational studies and randomized trials of effective therapy of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, I anticipate that my opponent will focus on the neutral or negative results of clinical trials of ineffective therapy. So be it. Now, observational studies starting in Spain with the red line shows that the risk of cardiovascular events is tenfold greater mortal or morbid events, tenfold greater if you have a severe obstructive sleep apnea, and virtually uh, compared with no sleep apnea if treated. The Wisconsin Sleep Heart Health Study showed in the general population that there was a significant uh, reduction in survival over a 15-year period if you had severe obstructive sleep apnea. Sorry, the Sleep Heart Health Study, led by Dr. Punjabi, showed again a relationship, a dose-response relationship between the apnea apnea index and survival in this community-based population. And in Olmsted County, the risk of sudden cardiac death is increased almost threefold if you desaturate below 93% at night. Overwhelming evidence of the importance. And even epidemiologic study shows us if you have sleep apnea and you're a man, you have a 58% greater likelihood to develop heart failure over a period of eight years or nine years. We as cardiologists should be very concerned that our patients have a much higher prevalence than the general population for obstructive sleep apnea. In hypertension, it may be up to 83% if it's resistant hypertension. Ischemic heart disease, stroke, heart failure with preserved systolic function, 40%. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 40%. End-stage renal disease, about the same number. And even with contemporary heart failure therapy, here you can see in green from Toronto, the Umino study, 26% of our heart failure patients have obstructive sleep apnea. In Europe, the Doliner study, 15%. In acute heart failure, the Kayat study from Ohio State, 61% of patients hospitalized with acute heart failure have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, with respect to the proposition, my great concern is that, and I will forewarn you, that my opponent may misconstrue or manipulate the proposition to speak to central sleep apnea, or to focus solely on heart failure, or to speak of other treatments than CPAP. I was indeed surprised that Dr. Howlett only spoke to CPAP in the proposition, because he might discover that continuous positive airway pressure is not the only means of treating sleep disorder breathing and heart failure. My opponent may bring this into the debate to muddle it for you. Now, where are we in heart failure? Well, on the left, you can see the residual mortality risk for stage two heart failure from the uh, trial of Entresto. And you can see that the three-year risk in primarily class two uh, heart failure is approximately 15% for cardiovascular death. On the right, you can see the three-year mortality risk for death in patients in the serve heart failure trial, class three heart failure, approximately 20%. So if we have identified a cause for residual risk and heart failure, why should we accept passively this high residual risk and not attempt to address it? And we have data, Dr. Bradley has shown us from the Toronto Heart Failure Community Study, that the risk of dying is threefold greater when adjusted for other factors if you have sleep apnea and ischemic cardiomyopathy as compared to mild to no sleep apnea. So this is where the residual risk lies in our patients. Dr. Abraham has shown us from his acute heart failure study 
that it is the patients with obstructive sleep apnea that are more at risk of dying over the following three years. What is the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea that confers such cardiovascular harm? Well, as you can see on the right, the first thing that occurs is a reduction in intrathoracic pressure. This can be up to 50 to 80 millimeters of mercury. This generates left atrial wall tension, leading to atrial fibrillation. This leads to increased left ventricular wall stress and cardiac oxygen demand, leading to dilatation of the ventricle and a mismatch between myocardial oxygen delivery and demand. Why is oxygen delivery reduced? It's because the patients become hypoxic. That hypoxia reperfusion that occurs at the end of the apnea will lead to oxidative stress. The, the hypoxia and the hypercapnia will lead to sympathetic activation and raise blood pressure and heart rate at night when the heart is not metabolically primed to deal with this stimulus. And so everything conspires acutely to lead to ischemia, to atrial fibrillation, and chronically to hypertension, left ventricular, left atrial, right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular dilatation, and tricuspid regurgitation and over time, atherosclerosis and cerebral vascular disease. And we and others have shown autonomic neuroplasticity as a result of obstructive sleep apnea with greater sympathetic traffic in the daytime, whether you have or do not have heart failure. This sympathetic activity is likely the cause of the excess uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias that occur in these patients. This meta-analysis of the impact of sleep disordered breathing on appropriate implantable cardioverter defibrillator therapy in patients with heart failure shows that the risk of this rhythm disturbance is increased by 55%, similar if you have obstructive or central sleep apnea. So it's these, are, these are the patients that are having arrhythmic sudden death. And what does obstructive apnea do? It gives you hypoxia. So independent of whether sleep apnea is diagnosed or not, it's the patients who have hypoxia at night who have heart failure are the ones that are subject to premature death. And very few cardiologists appreciate this because they see the patient in the daytime at clinic. The hypoxia itself leads to sensitization of peripheral and central chemoreflexes. This study from Italy tested chemoreflex sensitivity to hypoxia and hypercapnia in 110 subjects. And if you had no hypersensitivity, you lived for the full four or five years of follow-up. Whereas if you had both sensitivity to hypoxia and hypercapnia here in the bottom of the survival curve, your likelihood of dying within four years was 50%. We can treat this very easily with CPAP, so why not? All of those downstream effects are eliminated. If one looks at atherosclerosis in the carotid artery on the left panel here, in a clinical trial of four months therapy done by our former fellow, Dr. Lorenzi Filo in, in Sao Paulo, you can see that there is a regression of carotid atherosclerosis after four months. And if you look at the right panel, you can see the pulse wave velocity, a marker of ventricular vascular coupling, a risk factor for heart failure to surgery ejection fraction is diminished by treatment. In the Mayo Clinic experience, if you had a PCI and you did not treat obstructive sleep apnea, your risk of dying was significantly increased over the subsequent three to four years. If you look at Spanish studies, you can see that women who accept treatment for obstructive sleep apnea have a cardiovascular event rate that's 8% of the women who do not accept treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. Dr. Bradley conducted a randomized controlled trial of treating obstructive sleep apnea in heart failure. And here you can see on the, rest, on the right side panel the data with effective treatment of, of obstructive apnea, a reduction in the apnea pop index to four events per hour. And here you can see miraculously an increase in the ejection fraction of 9% of points, greater than achieved with any pharmacological therapy for heart failure. And you have a reduction in afterload, and you have a reduction in heart rate, and you have a reduction in sympathetic drive, all important risk factors. With Dr. Beanland, we have shown that an important risk factor for premature mortality in heart failure, that is of disturbed integrity of cardiac sympathetic nerves as measured with the PET uptake of 11-hydroxyephedrine and norepinephrine analog 
This is improved with CPAP treatment. So the integrity of sympathetic nerves and their, their arrhythmogenic potential is also improved. And the vagus, we all know that altered vagal heart rate modulation is a key risk factor for death in heart failure. This is improved within one month of treatment with positive airway pressure, according to data from Dr. Bradley's laboratory. Now here are data that Dr. Bradley published in 2007 from the heart failure program at our institutions. And you can see in blue the mortality of individuals who elected not to have their obstructive sleep apnea treated. Here in red, you can see a significantly better survival in those with mild to no sleep apnea. What do we conclude from this trial? Well, the obvious conclusion from this observational study is Dr. Bradley confers immortality by treating <laughs> obstructive apnea and heart failure with CPAP because the black line shows that no one at all died within the 80 to 90 month follow-up period in this study. So let me conclude. CPAP normalizes or attenuates determinants of cardiovascular risk. These include high heart rate, sympathetic drive, blood pressure, nocturnal hypoxia, aortic, ventricular, and atrial wall stress. CPAP reverses cardiovascular pathology, whether it be carotid atherosclerosis, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, or cardiac sympathetic integrity. And thus the proposition, and I emphasize this, that treating obstructive apnea with CPAP provides cardiovascular benefit has never been refuted definitively by a randomized clinical trial of effective treatment. Thank you. Please have a seat, uh, Professor Flores, and your opponent, uh, Professor Bradley, is uh, from my alma mater, University of Alberta, but uh, has spent a distinguished career here at the University of Toronto, um, uh, leading uh, the world, really, in the uh, treatment of sleep apnea. He's uh, uh, the Cliff Nordle Chair in Sleep Apnea and Rehabilitation Research and the Je Godfrey S. Pettit Chair in Respiratory Medicine. Uh, he's also the co-founder and chief medical officer of Brezotech Incorporated that has developed a home sleep apnea monitoring device. He's here to argue against the proposition. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and worthy opponent, Dr. Flores, my good friend and uh, an antagonist in this case. Um, you're a hard act to follow, as usual, but I will do my best. I kind of feel this is my disclosures here. I kind of feel like uh, a respirologist amongst cardiologists with this Goliath I have to fight. But let's see if David can outwit out, uh, this guy. Okay, so John showed this, this uh, study. This is a Spanish study, and I just want to go over it again. So basically, oh, it's a better point this way. Yeah. Okay, so this is cumulative cardiovascular mortality, and this is time from the patient who had a, had a sleep study. And the red line shows patients with severe untreated obstructive sleep apnea. The blue line, the green line represents patients without sleep apnea, and the blue line represents patients with treated sleep apnea. So, as he pointed out, there's a huge difference between the two that's highly significant. And these were 1,200 patients. Now, then, this, so this was a study done in Spain. Then the Spanish group put together a consortium to do a randomized trial of CPAP in patients with obstructive apnea. It was a clinic population from 14 Spanish centers. Inclusion criteria were, are there. Um, basically, they had to have sleep apnea. And um, they, uh, they could not have had a previous cardiovascular event. Now, this is the results that were published in uh, JAMA. And what you can see here is the CPAP treated group is here and the control group is here. Now, the outcome was the, uh, uh, the cumulative incidence of, heart, of uh, new onset hypertension and cardiovascular events. And as you can see, the vast majority of the events, so called events, was new onset hypertension, which is obviously easily treatable. Uh, and, but what you can see, though, is there's no significant difference between the two. So the reason I point this out is this is the same group that did the observational study, but in the randomized trial, there's no significant difference. So observational data from Marin suggests that OSA increases risk of fatal cardiovascular events independently of other risk factors, and suggests the therapy of OSA by CPAP reduces this risk. And I'm afraid my friend has uh, fallen into this trap. <laughs> 
However, the randomized controlled trial of Barbie showed no significant effect of CPAP in non-sleepy OSA patients, and I emphasize that non-sleepy, and I'll get to that later, uh, on incidence of hypertension or cardiovascular events. So these data do not support CPAP therapy in non-sleepy patients with OSA. Now here's another study. This was done in Sweden by Yuxel Pecker and his colleagues. And what they did is they took patients with untreated obstructive sleep apnea versus patients without sleep apnea and looked at the onset of new onset of coronary artery disease uh, in patients who were untreated versus those who had no sleep apnea. As you can see, again, observational study, highly significant difference between the two groups in, uh, in, uh, in favor of the non-OSA group. So untreated OSA seemed to increase the risk of developing coronary artery disease. Then the same person, Yuxel Pecker and colleagues, did a randomized trial. They had 244 patients with newly revascularized coronary artery disease and obstructive sleep apnea, again, without daytime sleepiness. So they were non-sleepy. Non and they were randomized to a trial of auto CPAP or no therapy. The primary endpoint was the first event of repeat vascularization, myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiovascular mortality. And the median follow-up was 57 months. And as in the previous study I showed you, you can see there's absolutely no significant difference between the two groups in terms of the onset of, of new cardiovascular events. So again, an observational study led us to think that sleep apnea was a, very, a risk factor for coronary disease, but when we actually treat the sleep apnea versus uh, not, we don't get any significant difference. So then the next trial is a sleep apnea cardiovascular endpoints, or SAVE trial, which was published in the New England Journal last year. It's a randomized trial of CPAP versus no CPAP in patients with a history of coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease and with obstructive sleep apnea and they were non-sleepy as well. And so the, the thing I want to point out here is that in many of these trials, the adherence to CPAP is not very good. So for example, here at the first month, patients are only using it for 4.4 hours. At 12 months, 3.5, and from the average use until the end of the trial was only 3.3 hours, so it's not very good. And that may be one of the reasons why some of these trials are negative. So here are the results of that trial. So this is 12, this is the largest trial ever done in sleep apnea. So this is comparable to the cardiovascular trials we've heard about today. 27 and 117 patients, randomized to CPAP or no CPAP. And as you can see, again, the theme comes out loud and clear. No significant difference between the two groups. Now John pointed out this study, which was done in our laboratory, in uh, collaboration with him and his colleagues at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And he's already pointed out that the patients with untreated uh, OSA who have heart failure have a higher mortality rate than either the group with no sleep apnea or those treated with CPAP. So this is an observational study from our laboratory, which fits with the data of other observational studies. But we decided to undertake a randomized trial to find out whether CPAP really or treating obstructive sleep apnea really does improve cardiovascular mortality. In other words, we're putting our money where our mouth is. And we've created the ADVENT HF trial because we believe there's equipoise in the area. And basically, we take patients who have heart failure with low ejection fraction, do a sleep study. If they have sleep apnea, they get randomized to a control group who receives optimal heart failure therapy or to an adaptive servoventilation group who uh, receives adaptive servoventilation, which is a fancy form of, uh, uh, of uh, CPAP that basically only provides pressure when the patient is not breathing. So it's like a cardiac pacemaker for uh, body arrhythmia. And the primary endpoint is the um, composite of uh, all-cause death, cardiovascular hospitalizations, appropriate ICD shocks, and atrial fibrillation requiring anticoagulation. So I guess the question really is, if sleep apnea increases cardiovascular risk, why have all these randomized trials been negative? Well, one possibility is that they're underpowered. Some of them weren't that big, but that's unlikely to be true for the large trial I showed you with 2,700 subjects. For ethical reasons, all these trials study non-sleepy patients. And the reason for that is we know that if we treat a sleepy patient with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, they get a dramatic improvement in their quality of life. And it's always been uh, felt by ethics committees that you cannot leave these people untreated. So we're left with treating people who don't have symptoms. And this may have led to relatively poor CPAP adherence. Perhaps treating sleepy patients would yield better results, but we're probably never going to be able to do that. 
The adverse cardiovascular effects of obstructive sleep apnea, including oxidative stress, vascular and left ventricular remodeling, are to some extent irre irreversible by OSA therapy. It could be that, there's, that it's, it's gone on for so long that they're not reversible. That's another possibility. However, treating the cardinal features of OSA, that is, snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness, may yield better results, but not necessarily by reducing cardiovascular risk, but by reversing snoring <laughs> or reversing excessive daytime sleepiness. <laughs> so with that, I will end. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd be interested to see your vote now. So Doug, have a seat up here. Sure. And I know that Professor Flores has a rebuttal slide. So uh, he's come fully armed. <laughs> So we'll allow him to share his rebuttal slide, and then we'll turn it to the decision makers in the audience. Well, I thank my uh, honorable opponent for revealing the fundamental flaw in his argument. And I would request permission to share with you more than one slide to fill the three minutes allocated. So the essence of my rebuttal can be summarized in the following slide. <laughs> The dunce cap, <laughs> the vapid expression, and the unwillingness to reveal the name. <laughs> because what we've heard are trials of ineffective therapy or partially effective therapy. And with respect to the SAVE trial, this largest trial, not really a trial done to the rigor that we would expect from Dr. Bradley's laboratory. The diagnosis was not made by polysomnography. There was no apnea apnea index calculated. The people most likely to benefit were not randomized, and we have this bias still in Canada. Those who are the most sleepy, those who had desaturation, these were not randomized. The enrollment was well below target, and there was concern that the majority of these patients were from China, local clinical resources may not have been optimal, and there is a concern of protocol violations. All the Indian sites were removed from this trial because of protocol violations after monitoring. I would also like to show you this slide, which gives you a sense of why adherence is important and why if you only have two to three hours of adherence to CPAP, you are not going to cover the time of night at greatest risk. This slide shows you the proportion of time that is spent cumulatively in REM and non-REM sleep over the course of the night. And REM sleep accumulates more in the latter hours of the night. And that is the time where you have the longer periods of REM, the longer periods of apnea, the more desaturation, the more hypoxia. So if you use your CPAP machine for only two to three hours, you are, and then get up to urinate, and then go back to bed and you do not wear the mask, you are not suppressing the apnea at the time of greatest cardiovascular risk. And this is the fundamental flaw of trials of ineffective or incomplete or halfway therapy. And so, is the dose adequate? The mean adherence during this trial is 3.3 hours. Is the timing appropriate? If it's not used later in the night, it's not doing its job. And interestingly, not only in this trial, but in the Barbe trial that Dr. Bradley alluded to, if you used it for longer periods of time, there were signals of benefit. In the CERV trial, this is for the primary endpoint, and for the cerebrovascular events, a reduction in risk of 46%. So we have not seen trials of effective therapy to date. And atrial fibrillation, I'm really quite surprised in a forum such as this, that the link between obstructive apnea, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure has not been more fully addressed. Fourfold risk of atrial fibrillation if you have obstructive sleep apnea in the sleep heart health study. In the Mayo Clinic, obstructive apnea is present in 49% of patients referred for cardioversion. Significantly higher rate of recurrence in those with obstructive apnea and hypoxia. 87% of patients who have recurrent atrial fibrillation after pulmonary vein isolation have obstructive apnea. 
And if you do not treat the obstructive apnea, you're more eight times more likely to fail pulmonary venous isolation. So in summary, we are not really at the point where we can answer the proposition in a way that is uh, uh, to Dr. Bradley's satisfaction. So it is important to complete advent heart failure because equipoise persists for both obstructive and central apnea. We will get novel data concerning the impact of alleviating negative intrathoracic pressure and the other consequences on the failing heart. We will get novel data on the natural history of the untreated patients, and we will have definitive evidence in support of today's proposition if this trial is successfully completed. Thank you for the opportunity to rebut. Thank you. Jack? So Dr. Bradley may not have slides, but uh, he doesn't need them. <laughs> he has an opportunity to rebut. Well, Dr. Flores has made some very important points, but I think the bottom line is he's almost admitting that I'm right, because what he's saying is we still don't know, we still haven't proven cardiovascular benefit of treating obstructive sleep apnea and heart failure, and uh, so he's actually fallen into my trap. Uh, I would emphasize again that we are, we are uh, putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, we are running this trial, the Advent HF trial. We have 452 patients randomized so far. Uh, we're looking to get 860, and if any of you are interested in joining the trial, or if you're not here, please let us know. But again, I believe that there is equipoise that this trial will ho hopefully answer the question whether treat treating obstructive sleep apnea does improve cardiovascular outcomes in patients with systolic heart failure. So I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Questions? If the uh, authorities do not allow you to randomize patients sleepy because of a benefit, which is included in cardiovascular benefit, I presume, um, how can you say that uh, this therapy is not effective? Well, as I try. Is this on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, as I tried to point out, um, uh, the observational studies that were done did include patients who were sleepy. And the ones who were treated, by and large, were the sleepy patients, and the ones who weren't treated were, tended to be the non-sleepy patients. So it is possible that treating sleepy patients, you would get better compliance with the CPAP, and you might get a better cardiovascular outcomes. But we haven't shown that. And uh, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to do that because, as I said, ethics boards won't allow us to randomize those kinds of patients. So um, I don't know what John has to say about that. Well, I, I'll say two things, Bruce. First of all, uh, it's not simply regulatory. We are getting resistance from our colleagues in sleep medicine who don't have equipoise. They, we've had a number of instances where people have a sleep study, and they're ready to, to be enrolled in our trial, and the sleep physician says, oh no, this patient's too severe, they must be treated. So the community, sleep community lacks equipoise, which we think is um, of great concern because there's sufficient information arguing that there is not equipoise. I would also like to draw attention to the concept I just touched on of autonomic neuroplasticity. We have evidence now from our own program uh, using functional magnetic resonance imaging that the brain actually changes, that there are areas involved in cortical autonomic regulation that thin with respect to hypoxia or thicken with respect to increased chemoreflex stimulation. And interestingly, it's the patients who are not sleepy who have the highest sympathetic drive and are likely the ones in heart failure who are more likely to die because of that high sympathetic drive. So we may be, in fact, dealing with the non-CDP population in heart failure that's most at risk and perhaps most to benefit. Kishan. Thanks very much uh, for the talk. It's great to have two world experts from the same town at the same meeting, so thanks for doing this. Uh, my question's to both of you. Can you help me understand why a large randomized trial, 2015 New England Journal of Medicine by Martin Cowie and colleagues for servoventilation and central sleep apnea showed an increase in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality, while the obstructive sleep apnea randomized trial did not show a similar signal. Also, as I understand, please educate me with a different uh, sleep device. Was it the central sleep apnea? Is it the heart failure? 
Is it the servo ventilation? Is it all three? Can you help us understand what are the components contributing to that? Robu we thought it was a robust signal in survey F. Yeah. HF, excuse me. Right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just say one yeah. thing. Doug can talk to the technical. The, the, the difficulty is that the investigators have yet to publish the data showing the effect of treatment. All you see so far is the impact of the allocation strategy. And there was 29% dropout. Dropouts are the ones who tend to do worse in the treated group. There was 16% crossover in the other. They were asked in the initial letters to the editor of the New England Journal, please provide the treatment data. We don't know whether these people died when they were wearing the device or not. We don't know whether the on-treatment data showed a similar effect. From our experience, it's conceivable that the harm was in those who abandoned the use of the device. And it's been a long time, and we haven't seen those data yet. Doug? Yes, uh, very good question. So in the um, SERV trial, which is adaptive servo ventilation for central apnea, so this is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about obstructive apnea. But anyways, it showed an increased mortality, both cardiovascular and all-cause, in the group allocated to ASV. Subsequently, they published a sub-study showing that the excess mortality was due to sudden death, which we, they thought was arrhythmic. And it wasn't, it, the sudden death didn't occur at night, it occurred around the clock, so there was no a particular time of day that it occurred at. So what it's suggesting is that they weren't dying while wearing the device, so it would not be a hemodynamic issue, I don't think. So what could cause a cardiac arrhythmia? Well, the device they used, which is quite, quite a bit different than the one we're using in our trial, was made by ResMed, and that time they had high, what we call default pressure. So uh, the ba you have to have a background of uh, CPAP because if you don't, you'll, you'll uh, rebreathe dead space and your CO2 will go up. So you have to have a certain amount of CPAP. And then on top of that, they would have pressure support, and the pr mi minimum pressure support was three, uh, well, the ma sorry, the minimum CPAP was five and the minimum pressure support was four, or three rather. So that meant that on every breath, they were getting at least eight centimeters of water, which is enough to ventilate you. Now, if you were overventilated, you would drop your CO2, you would become alkalotic, and you may become hypokalemic, particularly if you're on di diuretics. And I would put it to you that one, that one of the possibilities here is that they were overventilating the patients and causing arrhythmic death because of hypokalemia. Uh, now, there's no evidence for that because they didn't collect any data on it, but that would be my, the leading hypothesis. With respect to our device, it has a lower default pressures. So the minimum CPAP is three and the minimum pressure support is zero. So that means on every, sorry, minimum uh, CPAP is four. So that means that on every inspiration, the minimum they're getting is four and they may not get any ventilatory support at all. So it's much less likely that we would overventilate our patients. So we're happy about that. The other thing is we're titrating, we're doing all the sleep studies centrally and we're titrating, the, they're titrating the patients in the sleep laboratory, the data comes directly to my laboratory and we write the prescription. And uh, we're getting much better compliance. We're getting four point, between 4.4 and 4.8 hours of use compared to 3.7 in that trial. So we're, we're getting more effective treatment, we believe. With respect to the SAVE trial, now that was obstructive apnea in patients with coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, but not heart failure, so it's not exactly the same. Their compliance was even worse. Um, they didn't have uh, a negative effect, it was a neutral effect. Uh, but again, the whole issue there is, were, were they getting effective treatment, right? Where it was 3.3 hours a night enough? Well, it probably isn't. Unfortunately, because that's the biggest trial it's ever done, it's unlikely that anybody's going to uh, pay for another trial that large um, and the, the, the manufacturers of the positive airway pressure devices are a fraction of the size of the pharmaceutical firms and don't have the kinds of money to do the large trials that you're used to. It's not that we don't want to do them, so it's very difficult to do them. So I think that's probably the answer to your question. Michael. Yeah, I mean, excellent, excellent debate. Um, and it's hard for Doug, I know, to debate on your side. You did a fantastic job, both of you. Um, the issue is, is methodologic issues here. And you just alluded to it, Doug, about the funding and the endpoints. What I noticed is composite of endpoints that are multi, 
uh, multifactorial, right? You have hemodynamic, atherosclerotic, on top of the arrhythmia yeah. excess, which is the argument you made in the beginning, John, that this is an issue of sudden cardiac death. So I'm wondering about when you break out the different components of the endpoints, is there a signal for sudden death or cardiovascular death that's different from the overall signal? That's first point. You mean in the published trials published to date? Trials, yeah. yeah. In, in, the, in the evidence. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these guys are the experts, but yeah. unfortunately, there wasn't. <laughs> the the data from the trials will show you the cumulative curves for cardiovascular death, and the cardiovascular death is not impacted. So, so we're not seeing an increase in cardiovascular death, if that's your question, in the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea in these, in these trials such as so nor, no are we seeing a, nor are we seeing a reduction. So there's no heterogeneity in the endpoint. So the atherosclerotic, you might, you might the effects of the last five, six years, whereas the sudden death. Yeah, the, the one that I alluded to is in the, in the SAVE trial with the greater adherence subpopulation, yeah. which is a pre-specified subgroup in that sure. trial, strokes were reduced 48%, right. 46%. So then that begs the question, has it been a, a system or a patient level uh, systematic overview, meta-analysis, because you have underpowered studies with uh, huge composite endpoints. Can you, differences in the composites, can you, has there ever been a meta-analysis undertaken? Not at a patient level or event level. I think that's what they need. Yeah, well, the, certainly the, address this. Yeah, well, the, the, the reason there isn't is because, for example, the SAFE trial was just published six months ago. Sure. So there's not been enough time for people to, I'm sure somebody's writing one as we speak, uh, but at the moment there isn't such a meta-analysis that you're asking for. Um, yeah, I mean, the, whole, the, the biggest problem we have in the field is, is a lack of financial backing to do these kinds of trials because there certainly is an appetite to do them. We just don't have the resources. I mean, we were very fortunate to get uh, money from the CHR to do our trial. Uh, but as you know, the clinical trials uh, business at CHR is pretty well uh, six, deep sixed, unfortunately. But we, we continue on. We continue on. So maybe we can get the question back up and everyone can vote after that really incredibly thoughtful debate uh, uh, back and forth of how do people feel about the proposition that CPAP to treat obstructive sleep apnea provides cardiovascular benefit. True for A for true, B for false. <laughs> well, I would say we have not changed the needle. <laughs> well, I'm but, glad but the I'm audience not. still believes that no, you guys percent. have demonstrated. Two percent, two, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm glad this is a this is a battle I don't mind losing. <laughs> <laughs>